Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to 2022 ECE Colloquium Series. I'm Professor Mo Li. I'm a new associate chair for research. I'm also the instructor for this course series. So um, this year, we have a, 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 a very exciting list of mixed topics covering all the areas of ECE. We will continue to do that. So I'm really encouraging every one of you to come to attend this colloquium series in, in person. Especially, we expect to be completely out of the pandemic mode now. Since I'm the instructor, uh, and for the student who taking this course for one credit, there's some house rules okay, I'd like to announce. First, that you know, attendance is required, right? So check out the Canvas page. There's the syllabus and the credit requirement, right? So how do we count attendance? You have to submit a list of uh, take-home question, uh, take-home message you heard from the talk, right? All your questions related to the talk. Maybe we can relate some of your good questions to the speakers and get back to you. But uh, submit those on Canvas as assignment, and you have one hour to submit it after the talk, right? So we count. So there will be nine uh, colloquium speaks uh, to, uh, in this quarter. So if you, so I'll count at least five. So you have to submit at least five, five of them <laughs> as a as a way to do attendance. Second is, uh, you know, we like to all the students to stay here, don't come late or leave early. You know, stop using your phones or laptops, right? Remember, you are on camera. We actually, <laughs> you are being recorded. And uh, finally, this talk series, right, are nicely recorded and put on YouTube afterward. So you, uh, you have the results to review them afterward. But, you know, you have to submit your list of take home messages or questions within an hour, you know, as a way we can't attend this. Okay, with that announcement, I would like to pass to our first host, faculty host, Sarah. Thanks, Mo, and thank you all again for coming. So this week, uh, we're starting off our seminar series with Professor Clary Saeo from UCLA. Uh, she received her PhD in electrical engineering at MIT before becoming a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. And now she's leading the Qubit Lab at UCLA, and we'll hear about her work in a second. Beyond her uh, academic work, she's also done, or her research work, she's also done a lot of work to lower the barriers of entry into quantum information science, most notably with her work in Qubit by Qubit, as well as uh, a myriad of other things. And I would say last, and also probably least, she was my TA for quantum mechanics, intro to quantum mechanics, and so she is, in some ways, the reason that I'm here today. And with that, let's welcome Clarice, thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. Say yes, yes, awesome. Okay, cool. So first of all, I, I just want to thank my good friend Sarah for the invitation. Oh. And uh, again, I am so pleased to see that Sarah is supported and is thriving here as an early research faculty. It's my pleasure to, to see that too. I'm very happy for her. Uh, and again, today is a very nice day to be giving a talk on quantum because you probably seen the announcement of the Nobel Prize. So I hope I can excite you a little bit more about quantum stuff that happens actually in nature. So I like to call myself a quantum engineer. So this means that I build apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So people get a little bit surprised when I tell them that I study things that might be happening inside birds, inside butterflies. So before I tell you where I'm going, I really need to tell you where I come from. So we're going to start by talking about hardcore quantum mechanics stuff. And by the end of the hour, we will have talked about things of biological relevance, such as organismal migration, how our cells respond to oxidative stress, to radiation. And I hope I will have convinced you that I think we can learn with nature on how to build better technologies. And that's because I'm a quantum engineer who's interested in how quantum physics informs the biology at the nanoscale. So I... Um, start my talks by saying that I think that humankind is sort of obsessed with measuring things better because this might mean that we understand nature better. So we might think, for example, about measuring better frequencies or measuring better like how we define time units. This is an, an atomic clock that sits at NIST and it uses atomic transitions to uh, define very precisely what a second is. 
We can think about measuring better magnetic fields so that the image of your baby is better resolved. And yes, this is the MRI image of a baby inside the mother's belly. Or we can think about measuring better acceleration so that your gaming experience is enhanced. Those tiny little accelerometers are now ubiquitous in all our handheld devices. But the question that I ask is, what happens if the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? Or worse, what happens if the object causing the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? I'm going to argue that in this case, you need a tiny little sensor that can measure tiny little things. If the sensor is tiny, let's make it very tiny. Let's make it quantum. For reasons that I won't hi have time to fully explain to you, um, one can mathematically prove that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. So I'm going to talk about a technological quantum sensor with which I worked in the past, and I would like to tell you how it works. And this is not the main topic of my talk, but I'm going to use it to compare it to uh, what I'm going to, to argue are quantum sensors that exist in nature. Okay? But this is the promise. Um, I worked with a technological quantum sensor in my past, uh, and, and uh, many of you might be familiar uh, with it because there is research in this department that uses this quantum sensor. But actually, uh, one can put a, that's the promise, one single electron spin in diamond can be put to use as a quantum enhanced a sensor, in particular, for example, to measure magnetic fields. So let me talk to you a little bit about that. So that's the promise, right? So the particular electronic spin that I worked with in Diamond, um, it actually arises in a, um, as, a, a, as a defect in the crystalline uh, diamond lattice. And uh, the type of, of defect where we find the particular spin that I worked with is um, the type of crystalline defects that is responsible for the colors of those diamonds that you see there. And uh, those crystalline defects are called color centers. And they're called so because when you shine light at them, they absorb that light, they get excited, and as they de-excite, they emit light, they fluoresce. Okay. The particular defect that I worked with is, of course, for some of you in this room, called the nitrogen vacancy center. It arises naturally, but it can also be engineered. And it takes place when a vacancy atom, that is a missing carbon atom in the diamond matrix, uh, sits nearby to a nitrogen atom, which is the most commonly occurring substitutional impurity that you find in this lattice. When those two things come together, I mean, you, you can think of it as like a, a really an electronic mess, right? There are the impaired electrons of the vacancy, the extra electron of the nitrogen. There might be charges nearby. But something extremely nice happens when you start calculating the quantum mechanical energy levels of that electronic mess. And it turns out that the quantum mechanical energy levels of that structure really look like the quantum, uh, quantum mechanical energy levels of a single electronic spin. Okay. So you can forget about this in terms of this a lot of electrons interacting and think of it as a single electronic spin. And that's the spin that is going to be put to use as a very sensitive quantum enhanced magnetic field sensor. Here's how we play with those things in the lab. Right? So, Actually, the, the setups are not particularly intricate. It all works at room temperature. So the idea is that you put a diamond slab on top of a moving uh, stage, and you move this stage around uh, at the same time that you shine laser light onto it. It doesn't need to be laser light. Those uh, colorful diamonds, they work even in the absence of laser light. But in the lab, it's more convenient and it's more efficient to use laser light. So the idea is that as you hit with your laser on top of one of those defects as you raster your diamond sample, the moment that, that you actually hit one of those sensors, they're going to absorb the light, get excited, and then fluoresce back. And this is what it looks like at increasing zooms. Okay? And here, what you're looking at, this, this big blob, if you think about what it means, is actually quite remarkable. This is actually the fluorescence signature of a single effective electronic spin that sits in the diamond. The 
defect, the crystalline defect itself is much, much smaller, but this is a diffraction limited image. But still, if you think about it, uh, when you do magnetic resonance experiments, for those of you who are familiar with the term, uh, you need gazillions of spins to get an appreciable signal. Here, you can have the fluorescent signal of one single electronic spin, and that's quite remarkable. Uh, like uh, each, uh, I would say like 10,000, uh, 100,000 100, experiments, two microseconds each one. Okay. Is, that, is that a fair assessment? <laughs> okay. So um, it looks nice. It is very nice. And actually, it gets a little bit better than this, in fact. And that's because this defect, for reasons that I won't have time to explain, have a very nice property called quantum state dependence fluorescence intensity. This means that just by looking at how strong this blob, how strongly this blob is fluorescing, I can actually infer the spin state of the electron. This means that if I have a certain fluorescence intensity, the spin is up, and another fluorescence intensity, the spin is down. Okay? So this is a very convenient way of finding out the state of the spin by just looking at the fluorescence intensity emitted by this defect, which is very convenient. And I'm mentioning this for reasons that will become clear in the second part of my talk. But here's the promise, right? The promise is that we can put it to use as a very sensitive magnetometer. So here's how that works. So um, up there, 0 and 1 are just the two effective electron spin states, OK, up and down. Their resonance, their energy difference is uh, in the microwave regime. OK, so this y-axis here is uh, energy. And it turns out that state marked zero there is insensitive to magnetic fields. That is, if the diamond is immersed into an external magnetic field, state zero will not care. However, state one, in the presence of a tiny magnetic, or of a magnetic field, it's actually going to get promoted by a certain quantity that in the slide is denoted delta. And it turns out, many of you might have seen this before, this quantity delta via something called Zeeman energy is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field that the diamond is immersed into. And what I'm going to say now, if you're not awake, it's, it's a good time to be awake, because what I'm going to say now underlies all modalities of quantum sensing, which is what I'm talking about. The problem of measuring a magnetic field is actually mapped onto the problem of being able to measure a detuning delta from a known energy difference, from a known resonance. So we say that the, this defect in diamond, this effective spin in diamond can measure magnetic fields because the experimentalist knows how to measure detuning shifts from known resonances. And in fact, that is a signal processing problem that uh, has been tackled by electrical engineers and physicists for many decades now. And this, again, underlies most, if not all, modalities of quantum sensing. There is a certain uh, energy difference that is shifted by a well-defined quantity in the presence of the quantity that you want to measure, of a, so that by looking at energy shifts, you get indirect information about that quantity. And that quantity might be temperature, might be electric fields, might be magnetic fields, like here. So that's like how quantum sensing works. And that's actually very important. Right? That, that's like fundamentally a signal processing problem. So, but there's a catch. And the catch is that this uh, only works while that spin is well described by the laws of quantum mechanics. Everything that starts quantum dies classical. Quantum particles might start to interact with each other, and they all collectively get pulled down back to the classical state. And that's why we live in a macroscopic world that is classical. So that um, this very nice way of measuring tiny quantities only works while the spin is uh, in, in jargon, it's usually called coherent. It's well described by the laws of quantum mechanics. 
for naturally occurring diamond. Now this can be engineered okay, to, to, to be longer, but for a naturally occurring diamond, crappy diamond, actually the very first diamond slab that we worked was like a discard from a jeweler. So nothing special about like naturally occurring samples of, of diamond. Um, that time during which the spin retained its quantum state was about two microseconds at room temperature and in bulk, which um, if you come uh, from a background of uh, quantum or quantum information like Sarah and, and myself, y you know that this is quite remarkable. Two microseconds for a quantum object to live as a quantum object at room temperature is extraordinary, right? There's a reason why most modalities of quantum computers that we hear about, they happen in a vacuum or in, in a cryostat. So that you should, you should actually write that in your reports when you submit like your take home messages that two microseconds live for, for that spinning diamond to live as a quantum object at room temperature for about micro, two microseconds is extraordinary. Yes? Uh, oh, in bulk means uh, within the diamond lattice. Um, so, um, people do use uh, a collection of defects uh, together as like an ensemble of quantum systems here. I mean, for only one defect uh, that, uh, that lives in the solid state lattice uh, under the influence of nearby nuclear spins and other uh, spins from other impurities. That's what I mean. And actually, also, uh, we're going to see the idea is that we can put this tiny little sensor uh, close to a sample and uh, again, the sample is itself a noisy, spin noisy, right? And uh, even uh, under those very noisy conditions, we have pretty or good enough coherence properties for those spins. That's the idea. So. Again, two microseconds is already extraordinary, but um, can we do better? And in, in fact, uh, people know, have known since uh, last century, uh, from, from the beginnings of nuclear, of magnetic resonance, that there are ways of actually kicking those spins so that they can keep being in a quantum state for longer and longer. So you can imagine, you know, like if you have a swing and you know that if you kick it at particular times, you can keep it going, like swinging for longer and longer. Here it's the same idea. Like the idea here is that you can apply kicks and those kicks constitute, uh, are, constitu like, are, are made out of like electromagnetic radiation of light, if you will. And you can keep on kicking this spin so that it lives longer as a quantum object. And it's, again, a, a signal processing issue, right? So if you have the signal yielded by your uh, quantum sensor as a function of the time that you, that you acquire the signal, like at some point, the signal sort of flattens out. And at this point, if you keep on acquiring, if you Fourier transform it, you're not going to get a better resolution in frequency. So the idea here is that let's give it kicks so that you can acquire the signal for longer and longer so that when you Fourier transform it, you can have a better resolution in your frequency. And again, you do this by applying tailored electromagnetic radiation. So I'm going to go into the most technical slide of my talk. So don't fret. The big picture is this. Okay, the big picture is that we want a tiny little quantum sensor that we can bring in close proximity to a tiny little sample and measure tiny little magnetic fields produced by this sample. Okay, so that's the big picture. If you don't get my next slide, that is fine. I would like to share with you in this slide just one example of such a spin control experiment in the way that we can kick this spin so that it lives longer as a quantum object. So for example, uh, in this experiment that I'm going to share, we kicked the spins using a well-studied sequence of electromagnetic pulses called a rotary echo. This rotary echo sequence is depicted there in magnetic resonance jargon. Here's what this means. 
we want to measure the magnetic field that a certain spin in the diamond is sensing. What we do is we bring microwaves very close to this uh, spin in diamond, and we apply microwaves uh, on t like tuned to the energy difference between the two states in the absence of a magnetic field. And this microwave, and this is what's shown there, this microwave is always on, okay? It's a continuous wave, but at particular points in time, we give phase kicks to it. We're applying, and then we give a phase kick, and then we give a phase kick, okay? This is what this rotary echo sequence means. We're applying a uh, continuous microwave field on resonance with the original energy difference in uh, the spin's electronic states, continuous wave with phase kicks. Okay? And basically, the time in between phase kicks uh, can actually be chosen by the experimentalist. Okay? And this um, sequence, electromagnetic sequence, was developed for magnetic resonance in the 1950s, and it was used to correct for driving field imperfections, that is, imperfections in your microwave source. It turns out that um, it corrects for driving field imperfections, but it's also known not to correct for detunings from shifts from the resonance. And if you remember from my previous slide, detunings, shifts from resonance is exactly what you want to measure. So this sequence is very good as a helper to measure those shifts from resonance that, are going, that, that, that is going to actually encode the magnetic field information. And I won't have time to explain, but the, 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 the time in between phase shifts can actually correct for different types of noise that the sensor sees. But if we apply such a continuous microwave with phase kicks close to uh, a spin, that spin in diamond, we get a signal that looks like this. So let's decipher what this means. So this is the signal, which is just a fluorescence intensity normalized as a function of the time during which we apply such electromagnetic sequence, okay? So if you remember from the previous slide, differences in intensity of fluorescence correlate to different spin states, right? So if you are at the top of the signals there, this means, say, that you're in state up. If you are at the bottom of the signal here, you are in state down. And everything in between, if you are in a, in a part of the signal that is not at the top or at the bottom, you are, and maybe you have heard this term, in a superposition of up and down. For those, for the experts, uh, this is just a modulated uh, rubby experiment, if you will. It doesn't matter if you have never heard this. But the idea is that you can actually use a technique called average Hamiltonian theory to understand how the signal depends on a bunch of stuff, including the tiny little delta that's going to give you information about the magnetic field. So we know how this correlates to that, right? And then you can actually Fourier transform the signal you get something that looks like a spectrum. I'm not going to tell you how to read that. It's just like a, a spectrum looking stuff with several peaks. And actually using this formula, one can know exactly how to read out those peaks, which give, you, give us information on those deltas. And in particular, in this sequence here, in this signal, we are the Nitrogen Vacancy Center is measuring three different magnetic fields, the smallest one, which is about one-tenth of the magnetic field of the Earth. So this is how we do, like, control of this spin in diamond so that it works very well as a magnetic field source, because we can actually read out those detunings from resonance that give us information about the magnetic field. But again, this is the big picture, okay? tiny sensor close to tiny sample measuring tiny uh, fields produced by the sample. So this concludes the first part of my talk. And the first part of my talk is only there because I want to make sure that you've seen a quantum sensor 
that works at room temperature and in noisy environments. I've just shown you like, that that is a quantum sensor that works at room temperature and in noisy environments. Yes? Can, can, can you, can you? Oh, okay. Uh, what's the particular effect on the sensitivity and resolution of the sensor that is caused by this particular tuning algorithm? That, that is caused by this particular? Uh, tuning algorithm, the, the phase theta tuning algorithm that you described. So I'm not sure. So I don't have my glasses, so I, I, I even have trouble like fully seeing you. So I think you asked about the, 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 the timing of the phase changes. No. How does the timing of those phase changes affect the resolution and the sensitivity of the uh, diamond sensor? Yes. So um, one can uh, show, uh, even analytically, that um, depending on those timings, you can correct for different types of noise. Okay, like. Um, in a quantum experiment, there are different types of noise. There's noise that is along the quantization axis of your two uh, energy levels. That is, you have two energy levels, a small shift, and there's this uh, a wiggle, okay? And there's a noise that comes from uh, like the applied uh, field in control. It's like jiggle in the applied field, which is a different kind of noise. And you can actually prove that uh, if, you, if you change uh, this, this interval of phase kicks, you can be more or less resilient to one type of noise or, or the other type of noise. For example, if you don't, I mean, if you're an ex I mean, if, for the experts, if you never cho uh, change the, 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 the phase at all, you go back to the limit of a pure uh, Rubby oscillation. It's, it's just like a constant uh, field. And Rubby, uh, uh, like a Rubby experiment, can also give you information about the detunings. Uh, it, it's, but it's not very, uh, it's, maybe you should talk more, but it's, it's, it gives you actually information about the detunings, but it, if, you, if you go to the formula, the detuning appear as like a, that, that tiny little delta squared. It's not super sensitive as the detuning. Okay. So, but on the other hand, uh, if you keep your uh, spin excited with light continuously, as in a Rabi experiment, it can keep on as a quantum state for relatively longer than if you, if, so, so it, it's a trade-off of different things. And it's a long, uh, I'll be happy to talk more at some point. But it's, it's a very nice theory, actually. But, and it's out of the, whee. OK. But now we're at the midpoint, because we're getting to the place where I really want can I, can I just, okay, we can talk more because I'm, I'm really getting excited because that's not even what, what I'm here to talk to you about, okay? So up to, to like five years ago, those were the type of sensors that I was used to dealing with, you know, all those humankind made sensors. But at some point, I realized that nature many, many times made sensors that outperformed humankind made sensors in crazy, crazy ways. So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about a nature-made magnetic sensor. I'm going to argue that it, it works very similarly to the way that the, the spinning diamond works. Okay? And uh, I would like to tell you where we're going. We want to develop, we're starting to develop at UCLA uh, instrumentation to study and control those quantum sensors in nature as if they were, because they are bona fide quantum sensors. So let me tell you the story, okay? So there's going to be biology and stuff. So let's start with biology at the nanoscale, namely the chemistry. So it's actually known uh, from a field called spin chemistry for many, many decades. There is no doubt whatsoever that magnetic fields can alter 
the final products of a class of chemical reactions that depend on spin. In broad lines, here's how this works. There's a chemical reaction happening, and at some point, this chemical reaction comes to a crossroads. At that point, the chemical reaction effectively looks for the spin state of a certain electron, of a particular electron. If the electron is up, if the electron spin is up, the chemical reaction continues through one branch. If the electron spin is down, the chemical reaction continues through another branch. Importantly, the final products of those two branches are macroscopically different. Okay, so a finicky quantum property might actually, well, actually has important consequences on the outcomes of a chemical reaction. The other thing that you need to know is that if a spin, at the point where the chemical reaction comes to this crossroads, if the particular spin interacts very briefly with the magnetic field in a way that is absolutely identical to the way that the nitrogen vacancy center interacts with the magnetic field, this is really like quantum sensing. If, a spin if that spin interacts with the magnetic field, the magnetic field might actually alter the probability of finding the spin up or the spin down. So a brief interaction of that particular spin with the magnetic field might, again, macroscopically alter which chemical reaction path is taken and might macroscopically alter like, the final products of this chemical reaction. This has been demonstrated at room temperature in the gas phase, in the solid state, in the solid phase for magnetic fields as small as the magnetic field of the Earth, which is two orders of magnitude smaller than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to your face. Right? And, um, you know, this was a well studied chemistry phenomena. And again, I, I really don't care about birds, but birds have the big advantage that birds were the organisms that brought this whole conversation to where we are today. So here's what happened, right? So it's again been known for many, many decades that birds, when they migrate, that they do so following, at least as a partial cue, the magnetic field of the Earth, again, which is tiny, right? So how might they do this? And many hypotheses have been floated around, none that, that uh, actually corresponded to, to the outcomes of the experiments that people were doing with birds. In 78, those crazy biophysicists, like crazy theoretical biophysicists at the time, like they, they, they made this very outrageous, preposterous proposal, right? They said something like this, well, maybe were this type of spin-dependent chemical reaction be happening inside an organism, like under the massive physiological conditions of a cell inside a bird, birds and organisms, right, might sense magnetic fields to the extent that they might sense different physiological concentrations of products coming from those two branches of the chemical reaction that are affected by magnetic field. Again, that, at that point, this was absolutely crazy, just a crazy hypothesis, and that, so this has never been either proven or disproven, but here's the idea. The idea was like, well, maybe the birds, they have something in their eyes that when they look right or left, they interact with different magnetic fields, and maybe the different magnetic fields, you know, give rise to products that modulate the light sensitivity in the retina of birds differently, so that birds might actually see field lines and know where they have to migrate. Just a hypothesis at that point. But luckily, some uh, experimental biophysicists started, got excited by this idea, and they started looking for animals, or like, they started looking for animal proteins, because birds, everything started with birds, that could sustain such spin-dependent chemical reactions. And at that point, now, as we're going to see, it's much, much more broader than that. But at that point, the only animal protein that was known to sustain, to be able to sustain such spin-dependent chemical reactions was a protein, uh, a photoreceptor protein, a flavoprotein called cryptochrome. Okay? Now, cryptochrome is present in the eyes of migrating birds, in the antennas of migrating butterflies, but surprise, cryptochrome is also present in all our cells because it also has circadian rhythm uh, regulation functions. 
Okay, so cryptochrome, uh, again, is a fluorescent protein. It has a, a pigment, something that fluoresces called a flavin. So people started looking at cryptochrome for uh, putatively involvement in magnetosensitivity of species. And it turns out that cryptochrome is very uh, conserved throughout the tree of life. All those organisms there express cryptochrome, and uh, all the experiments boxed in red uh, are experiments for which there have been large-scale experiments correlating cryptochrome with the magnetosensitivity uh, of those organisms. And yes, humans are right there. Actually, I'm really convinced, and this is a research spanning almost four decades now, uh, that evidence for cryptochrome-based magnetosensing is really, really widespread, unfortunately, at very disconnected land scales. So let me talk to you about the very tiny land scales and the very large land scales. So for the very tiny land scales, for cryptochromes in solution, in test tube, there is now no doubt whatsoever that they are behaving like a bona fide, that the spin inside cryptochrome, like of a particular electron in cryptochrome, is behaving like a bona fide quantum sensor. And actually, I'm not telling you the whole story because the particular chemical reaction that is magnetosensitive in cryptochrome involves not one but two electron spins, but I'm simplifying the picture here. The idea is the same. There is no doubt whatsoever that cryptochrome in solution is behaving as a bona fide quantum sensor. Let's see the evidence to see if you agree with me. For example, and that's that plot up top left there. Researchers recorded the fluorescence of a test tube of cryptochrome as a function of the time during which they excited the protein with a laser. Again, it's a fluorescent protein so that if you apply laser of a certain frequency to it, it gets excited and then emits light. What you see is that that fluorescence is dying down. This is called bleaching. The laser is killing the chromophore. But as the researchers pulse a tiny magnetic field on and off as they are recording, and this is not noise. This has been repeated using different magnetic fields, different frequencies. What you see, like in the inset there, is that the fluorescent level is sort of modulated in a way, you cannot see that in the picture, but the fluorescence intensity is modulated in a way that follows the field. This is in one-to-one -one similarity to what I described for the nitrogen vacancy center, the spin in diamond. If you remember, just by looking at how strongly that blob was emitting light, you could infer if the electron spin was up or down. Here it's the same just by looking at how strongly the fluorescence is being emitted, you can actually infer, in this case it's two electron spins, I told you half of the surprise. You can actually infer if the two electron spins are in a singlet, one pointing up, one pointing down, or triplet states, or whether the, 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 the chemical reaction continued to the singlet or the triplet branch, giving rise to different products. Yes? Yes. Here it's a test tube. Here's a test tube. With, like, an animal of the That's spin. correct. So one would expect that the spins are, you know, all every which way, right? So how do you? So, so the the so model. So the the easiest way to model this. It's not the most complete way, but um, the idea is that the two electron spins have local. Uh, different local magnetic field environments. Okay? In particular, one, one of them is effectively free. The other one has a, a anisotropic uh, hyperfine interaction with nearby uh, electron, uh, nuclear spins. And if you just do the evolution, it's like the minimal model is like three spins. Two electron spins that do not talk to each other but start in a singlet state. This is free. This is hyperfine coupled to one nuclear spin. And you can show that this model uh, yields uh, uh, dependencies on magnetic field strength, frequency, and direction. So when, when averaged together among all the proteins? So for that experiment, yes, the proteins are tumbling. This is not the case for birds. 
birds are actually known to be sensitive to the direction of the magnetic field of the Earth, and for that you would need the proteins to be anchored, and this is uh, sort of what happens. Those proteins are anchored, anchored in the retina of birds, so uh, in, in that case, the birds are sensitive to the direction of the magnetic field. Here, they are responding to the magnitude of the magnetic field, even if they're tumbling. We can talk more about the models in a second. But this is sort of what's happening with the Nitrogen Vacancy Center in Diamond. Uh, there's data, uh, it's uh, not absolutely convincing, but there's data that says that the spins in cryptochrome remain in their quantum state at room temperature for about one microsecond. Again, which is more or less on par with what I quoted for the naturally occurring diamond, which was two microseconds, okay? Also quite impressive, all of this. So, test tube, this cryptochrome is behaving as bona fide like as, as, as a set, right, cryptochromes in solution, the electron spins are behaving as bona fide quantum sensors. Now, unfortunately, the next length scale of available evidence is like huge, right? There are experiments, say, with flies, with birds, that are mostly consistent with what's expected from the, the chemical model. You know, but it's very hard to say, well, the bird is doing its thing because there's a quantum process occurring somewhere. Let me talk through uh, some of the evidence, right? For example, people grab 20 birds during migration season. Those experiments are super hard, super beautiful again, but they're not enough, right? They put them into cages. They want to see where the bird goes out of the cage, and they, they mess up with the magnetic field that the birds see, and they want to go through different directions. Flies. Flies do not migrate, but they can be, I have no idea how they do this, like harder than quantum mechanics. Flies can be trained to find food based on the presence of a magnetic field. So they, they, they find food if the magnetic field is, is on, and then the researchers knock out or removed the cryptochrome gene from the flies, and the flies were no longer able to find food when the magnetic field is turned on. Like, in a further research, the researchers put back human cryptochrome inside the flies, and the flies were back to finding food in the presence of a magnetic field. Again, all of this is consistent with what happens chemically, but that's not enough. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to bridge those two land scales. Okay, so we want to start doing quantum sensing-like experiments in cryptochromes and other proteins, say, inside a cell, a couple of cells from the bottom up, right? So we are building glorified microscopes with coils, okay? And those microscopes will be able to study and importantly control those spins inside those proteins as if they were because they are bona fide quantum sensors, right? So um, when I tell you that we're building we're building microscopes with coils. The microscopes won't, don't look like this. Neither of those pictures are from my lab. Those are internet pictures. We're still building stuff. Like, it doesn't look like a microscope like this. It looks like what you would get in a quantum computing, quantum sensing lab, right? It's a big optical table with plenty of electronics. And this type of research is within a emerging field, uncomprehended field called quantum biology. And I think that the bottleneck of this field is really this lack of quantum-inspired instrumentation to uh, actually address those quantum degrees of freedom in biology. Right? So again, what's cool is that we use, which is a little bit different from most biophysics experiments, is that you use mathematical models to inspire like the experiments that you're going to have. You, you actually can make predictions as you would in a quantum experiment. For example, you can um, use the photophysics of cryptochrome in the sense to start making little uh, predictions using like a crappy spin model. Like I have theory friends who, who do very complicated uh, spin models, but even for us like experimentalists, we can already start to use the standard tools of quantum mechanics to uh, predict some things. For example, let me show you some of the predictions. Again, uh, it's our prediction. Other people have um, 
done similar predictions, but I mean, nobody has taken this data experimentally. We're dying to take it experimentally. So have a look at this top right plot there, okay? What you see there is the simulated magnetosensitivity of cryptochrome as a function of magnetic field strength for, again, proteins tumbling in solution, okay? What you see in the prediction, there's a couple of very interesting things. First one is that the dependency on the magnetosensitivity, how sensitive the protein is to magnetic fields, is not monotonic in magnetic field strength. It goes up and down. Importantly, at about 10 times the magnetic field of the Earth, say 600 microtesla, this magnetosensitivity is decreased. Okay, it's almost zero. And actually, given the spin physics, I won't have time to explain, but this is well understood. Those chemical reactions that depend on magnetic field, they depend on tiny magnetic fields, on the order of the Earth's, on the order of the magnetic field produced by your cell phone. This means that if you put a vial of magnetosensitive protein inside a big five tesla magnet for your magnetic resonance imager, that big five tesla is not going to do anything. The, the thing that makes a difference as a rule for all those spin-dependent chemical reactions, we're going to talk about more of those soon, are weak magnetic fields. The second very cool thing that we see is that that magnetosensitivity curves, it peaks very close to the magnetic field of the Earth which is either a coincidence or it indicates that there might have been some sort of evolutionary pressure for uh, the cryptochrome protein if it's putatively involved in how birds sense the magnetic fields to migrate. This protein evolved to work best under the conditions where it evolved. We are, are, are just quantum engineers. We cannot uh, differentiate between those two options, but we think that people who do directed evolutions of protein, they can help us uh, check if there has been some evolutionary pressure there. So, so those are some very, very cool things, right? So if that's true that there has been some evolutionary pressure, this means that nature, you, you know, it, 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 it really knows how to build their quantum sensors, like optimize quantum sensors. So how do we do this in real life, right? If we know that there is a certain magnetic field that we want to, to be able to sense, how do we design sensors like this? So this is something that I find extremely, extremely cool. But in the minus two minutes that I have, I want to say that, again, it's not about birds. Birds were important to bring this field to the mainstream, but it's absolutely not only about birds, and that's why it gets super interesting. There's, again, evidence, more or less macroscopic evidence, like with plates of cells, or, or even chemical evidence for things in solution, that the same type of spin-dependent mechanism might underlie so many different relevant physiological functions, okay? For example, the production of reactive oxygen species has been shown to depend on magnetic fields in a way that is consistent with a spin model under the hood. Um, stem cell uh, mediated growth, um, DNA repair yield, uh, cellular autofluorescence, probably from mitochondrial flavoproteins, is magnetic field dependent in a way that is consistent with a spin mechanism driving the interaction with those magnetic fields. The, 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 the picture that makes people understand the importance of that is this picture here. When, when I show this picture, pe people get excited. So I didn't take this picture. This picture was taken by a friend of mine from Germany. His name is Peter Fehlinger. He's like a precision measurement physicist. Here's what he does for a living. For a living, he, he develops like very good Faraday cages, hypomagnetic chambers, and then he shoves ultra-cold experiment, ultra atoms experiments inside to measure like very tiny little things. So he started hearing things about, oh, magnetic field effects in biology, so here's what he did. Now, first of all, this experiment has been reproduced by two other groups, one bio group and one physics group that all have these hypomagnetic chambers, and two, there are controls, okay? So for two days, because that's as long as he could go without asking for a bio license, he's a physics guy, right? He grew tadpoles inside one of those hypomagnetic chambers, okay? And uh, this, again, magnetic field of the Earth is about 50 microtesla. Inside his hypomagnetic chambers, he got like about one nanotesla DC noise level, right? So if, if he applied internally a magnetic field that mimicked the magnetic field of the Earth, the tadpoles were okay. 
but in the absence of the tiny magnetic field of the Earth, after two days, about macroscopically, about 30% of the tadpoles were malformed. So let, 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 let's see if we understand what this means. So we're, we're, not, we're not even applying a magnetic field. We're taking out a tiny magnetic field, and we're messing up with a lot of things. And that's actually not, that's the most impressive thing that I've seen. Uh, actually, you know, like, because we're just taking out a tiny magnetic field and making things go crazy like this, everyone's best bet is that this is mediated by a spin-dependent chemical reaction. And actually, my best guess is that melanin, the pigment that gives the skin color and gives the tadpoles their color, there's super rich spin physics in melanin. So I, I, my bet is that this is melanin related. And there are other experiments that have been made showing that there are, if you grow cells under hypomagnetic field conditions, there's like epigenetic, genetic changes. So all I'm saying is that we really need to start looking at those things, right? This has so many potential implications. It's a Pandora box of, of things we can think about. For example, if you want to colonize Mars, what's the magnetic field on Mars? Can we grow lettuce in Mars? Can we reproduce in Mars? And, and surprise, the magnetic field in Mars is way smaller than the magnetic field of the Earth. So like, what we're trying to solve in my group is really like to use quantum-enabled instrumentation to either establish or refute the extent to which actually spin physics might be influencing big time how we work. Right? So where <laughs> I'm dead serious when I say that what I would like to learn is how to deterministically control like each chemical reaction that depends on magnetic fields depend on different magnetic field field like strengths, intensities, and directions. I would like to have a map, right? So I would like to have a quantum map of which magnetic fields influence which kind of chemical reaction so that maybe in 30 years, you get your phone, you, you, you open an app, right, and say, well, today I need help with wound healing, which has also been shown to be magnetic field dependent. I need help with wound healing. And then you click there, and your cell phone produces the correct magnetic field intensity and frequency for you to do wound healing, and then you do this, right? But in order to get there, we need those quantum inspired experiments that do not currently exist, experiments that actually use quantum tech to treat those quantum mechanical endogenous degrees of freedom in biology as bona fide quantum objects. So that's where we're going, right? We're not the only people thinking about this uh, problem, about throwing quantum tech in biology. Um, I would just like to finish by thanking my uh, group. Um, the people in blue are uh, postdocs in red, are, uh, in, in green are grad students or visiting students, and the others are uh, administration and um, undergrads. And those people, they, they get it. They get the vision where we want to get. And they, they were super brave to start a lab during the pandemic you know, uh, for a theme that is like quantum biology that is not super well understood. And I would like to finish uh, by saying, as I often say, may the quantum be with you. What are your questions? <laughs> yeah, I think I will need the microphone because. I can try to speak really loud. Yes. And repeat the question. Great. So, um, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about using. Diamond as a magnetic sensor. I'm yes. wondering for your current experiment with Biosensor, do you use do you use that as Biosensor? Do you or do you No, we that? want to bypass the middleman. We want to bypass the nitrogen vacancy sensor. Right? We want to treat those quantum mechanical degrees of freedom as if they were, because they are like directly as quantum sensors. Right? What some people use is to they they take nitrogen vacancy centers inside nanodiamonds, they shove them inside cells, and then they can learn about classical biology using this quantum sensor. What we want to do is sort of radically different. We want to instead directly address those spins in biology, like as if they were like themselves the quantum sensors, and directly talk to them without the intermediation of like a quantum sensor, a technological quantum sensor. So just to follow on, so, so would, you, would you use the same experiment 
That, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a quantum sensing experiment that works on a biological sample. It's like light matter interactions where matter is biomatter. Yes, uh, uh, I, think, I think it was like from the order here, here. Yes. So my question, so you said that it's not all about the bird. And so of course, I started thinking of other animals that we think might be using magnets to get around. And one of the ones I thought of is the salmon, which I was thinking about how the bird, normally it flies north and south, right? It's pretty simple of a path. But the salmon, right, it has to navigate and find its direct river home. And so I was thinking, is the magnetic, their ability to sort of see it or, or sense it in some way, like how fine of a detail can that go depending on different species, right? Like, uh, uh, I, can they detect minor fluctuations and patterns? Again, I, I don't know, and that's one limitation of this kind of large scale, beautiful experiments, right? You, you don't have a lot of access to, to birds or to like follow the salmon. Just, um, I don't know how it works in salmon, uh, but um, rays and sharks, they seem to sense the magnetic field, but not using this. They have like conductive channels, and when they cross magnetic field lines, there's like a, 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 a what's the name? There, there's a voltage that is induced. So this is for like sharks and rays. So I have no idea about salmon. I don't think anyone has done experiments relating cryptochrome to salmons. There have been experiments linking a cryptochrome to turtle migration and to butterfly migration. So I have no idea about like the other animals. But, but again, the thing is that this is way broader than migration, right? It's time we start we started talking about this in terms of, of health, even, right? Like, for example, there is again a correlative evidence that weak magnetic field messes up how uh, ion channels work, okay? If this turns out to be true at the nanoscale, if, if it's, it, it's proven that it's actually a spin mechanism, well, here's another way of doing optogenetics, right? If you, if you know about optogenetics, what people do is they, um, again, I'm not a biologist here, but uh, they uh, genetically encode some proteins that uh, upon a, like uh, application of light, those proteins uh, make ion channels open and close. And ion channels opening and closing affects all like our biological process in some crazy way. If we could show at the nanoscale that ion channel functioning is influenced by magnetic fields in a way consistent with spins, well, you, you have your like endogenous magnetogenetics or whatever, right? You don't need to encode anything. Lasers, uh, they don't penetrate very far, magnetic fields do. Right? You would have, the ter if we learned how to do this with a quantum code book, we would learn deterministic ways of tweaking physiological parameters. It would be a whole other way of affecting biology, of affecting treatment. Right? Again, this is not going to happen in five years, in 10 years, but the research needs to start at some point and start in a quantum way. And here's what we're trying to do. There was a question up there. Yes. You mentioned the uh, cryptochromes, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, quantum state duration at room temperature. As a general rule, would that uh, duration increase or decrease as temperature increases, to say, like a few? As long? temperature increases, uh, the quantumness of things tend to go down, as a rule. And, and just for, for, OK, so there are better ways of quantifying it. OK, there's like proper ways of doing, but let, let me share with you a uh, a back of the envelope calculation of why one microsecond for cryptochrome might be, might be enough for it to sense the magnetic field of the Earth. So, in the presence of magnetic fields, electron larmor precess around this field, right? And uh, back of the envelope calculation is that if the quantum object is quantum for the time that it takes for it to do a full rotation around that certain magnetic field strength, this is a more or less good indication that it can sense the magnetic field. So the magnetic field of the Earth is 50 microtesla. For an electron spin to Larmor precess once, it would take 700 nanoseconds. And again, it seems 
that cryptochroming solution is quantum, is coherent for about one microsecond at room temperature. So it should indicate that it has enough quantumness time, coherence time, to sense this magnetic field of the Earth because one microsecond is larger than the 700 nanoseconds that it would take for it to process. All right, so, so it's about 11.30. Clarice can stick around for a little bit to answer any other questions from the audience, but let's thank her one more time and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.